and education in Afghanistan and hopes to see every Afghan woman and every Afghan girl win back their fundamental rights, including their right to education. Our second speaker is Dr. Tahira Danish. And Tahira teaches human rights law. She grew up being inspired by courageous role models in her native country of Iran. Following her escape to the West, she's lived and worked within diverse global cultures and countries. She leads and assists a number of charities and civil society organizations and welcomes the opportunities to promote learning. Tahira is passionate about supporting and advocating for marginalized and minority communities. And she's an entrepreneur and an advocate for the United Nations Global Compact Principles and a member of the 30% Club. Maybe she'll tell us a little bit about that when she speaks. Okay. She holds a PhD in law and has contributed to a range of publications, particularly focused on human rights, on policy and education. And she believes in elevating shared consciousness through practical approaches to complex processes. So we will um, begin with Shura. So Shura will be our first speaker. So each of the speakers will um, share their reflections with us for 10 to 12 minutes. And then after they've spoken, we will have a Q&A session with the audience. And then um, I will make some closing comments of uh, my own. And that will be it for today. So thank you very much for joining us. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Shura. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I first would like to um, um, say that happy uh, International Women's Day to all the st strong, intelligent, talented, and simply wonderful women out there. Um, and uh, extend my gratitude to LIDC for giving me the platform and um, the opp opportunity to reflect um, on the challenges that women in Afghanistan face after the, uh, the fall of the country to the Taliban um, and uh, the resistance that are taking place. Um, so uh, based on social contracts between the uh, government and the people, the government all over the world are, uh, ought to provide its citizens with facilities and services. Uh, however, um, the de facto government in Afghanistan, which is known to be a conflict affected country, is the only government in the world, as well as uh, among the uh, Muslim countries, that is uh, pushing its 50% of population or more from the uh, public sphere, uh, which includes work and education. And I think uh, work and education are the two uh, most fundamental basic human rights uh, that women in Afghanistan are deprived of. Uh, so today in my speech, uh, I will be highlighting some of the shocking figures of how uh, women in Afghanistan are erased uh, from the social and public uh, circle uh, by the Taliban. Uh, first of all, uh, there used to be 30% of women working in civil service uh, before the Taliban coming to power. However, there are now 0% of women uh, working in this area. Um, except the women that are working in health sector, and that is only because uh, women patients are allowed to uh, get their checkups checkups done by the uh, by the female uh, doctors. So basically, if you're a woman in Afghanistan and you get sick, you're not allowed to go to a male doctor and get your checkups done. Um, Secondly, we have a massive transformation of female students in schools, which means that we have come from 4 million female students to only those uh, female students who are um, only allowed to attend uh, school up to secondary level, which is sixth grade in Afghanistan. Um, it is worth mentioning that there is 0% women enrollment and participation in, univers in universities. Um, it is saddening to see that uh, we have come from 28% of women in the parliament to no existing parliament at all. And from several uh, female ministers to literally uh, zero female ministers in the Taliban de facto government. And last, uh, last but not the least, from having um, 3,500 female journalists to only 200 female journalists. And uh, those journalists who are mm, responsible for reporting the news are asked to cover their faces while appearing in the, in the news and in the t uh, TV channels. The list can go on and on, but can you imagine if all of this exclusion was happening to the opposite gender, what would the reaction be? The reaction would obviously have been very strong um, and violent. However, the same strong and violent reaction that is expected to happen by the male gender is not happening by the female gender. And why is that? Because women do not pose 
a security threat to the Taliban in Afghanistan, and they cannot be involved in um, different security groups. So therefore, they're found easy to be ignored by the Taliban. But still, I have to mention that even though women are not involved in the military groups uh, to fight against the Taliban, they have their uh, voice and their courage to stand against the uh, injustices that are taking place. So since the fall of uh, my country to the Taliban, there have been systematic resistance organized by the women of Afghanistan living inside and outside Afghanistan. And these resistance are um, in response to uh, suppression and the radical ideologies of the Taliban. Uh, one of the major things that have happened in Afghanistan in the last 20 years was the transformation of the society. So I can proudly say that Taliban are facing a transformed and educated generation of Afghanistan. Um, there has been a huge awareness of rights among people. Um, therefore, soon after the Taliban retook power in, um, on the 15th of August, 2021, women were on the streets uh, protesting for their rights and uh, knowing uh, despite the fact that the situation on the ground was very intense which means that women were protesting against an extremist group who were um, uh, who have killed people and were committing uh, suicide bombings in schools, mosques, uh, hospitals, shops, and public places. So um, even, uh, even though having a very dark memory of the Taliban era from 1996 to uh, 2001, when they first were in power, women were brave enough to go uh, out in the streets and demonstrate against the oppres uh, oppressive actions of the Taliban. Of course, those women and protesters were arrested and they have brutally been tortured for the past more than one year, uh, but they didn't give up on asking for what is meant to be theirs. Their rights um, were taken away from them without any legal or Islamic base. By this being said, um, if we look at it from the Islam, uh, Islamic aspect, the first word in the Holy Quran the, um, uh, starts with uh, Iqra, which means read. So if God and if Islam um, allows me to educate and to read, then why are Taliban denying this fact and depriving me of my, uh, my basic human right? Um, but if we look at it from the legal aspect, the Article 3 of the Constitution uh, stipulates that the citizens of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan have uh, equal rights to education uh, without any discrimination. So uh, when Taliban took power on the 15th of um, August 2021, uh, I, along with my, with my family, were still in Kabul. Uh, I didn't want to leave Afghanistan. I, I, I wanted to uh, continue to stay there uh, as I have lived all my life in that country. Uh, and I remember a few days after the Taliban came to power, I, with my sister, went outside to sit in a cafe uh, and to roam around the city as we normally would do before the Taliban take over. Uh, we wanted to basically breathe some fresh air as we were at home all day after the takeover and it was suffocating for us. So going out and sitting in a cafe was um, our only coping me mechanism and a form of um, uh, protest against the Taliban's uh, suppressing measures. However, um, as we arrived at the cafe and the, the, the street that we usually used to go before the Taliban take over, we saw Taliban's huge military cars with guns and armed uh, soldiers. Uh, people's movement uh, was very much limited. We could barely see any women on that street, and it was like a ghost city to us. Um, because we only heard about the Taliban's dark era from 1996 until uh, 2001, from the stories of our, our parents. Some of us were not, not even born at that time, or some of us were kids at that time. But when, when we saw that uh, those stories of our parents are now uh, becoming as a reality, uh, it was scary and very heartbreaking. So that's when we decided to leave our country and uh, temporarily go somewhere where we have our, the freedom to go outside without any fear. Um, of course, the decision and the journey of le leaving Afghanistan was never easy and still is not easy. It is very difficult for us to um, believe that we no longer are in our own country of origin and we can no longer par be part of the progress of our own country. Uh, although I'm studying in, a, in one of the best universities in the world, uh, but I'm still struggling to find my way and digest the trauma of uh, living, uh, leaving my country. 
Um, nevertheless, um, I call myself lucky to be uh, in a safer place um, where I can freely practice my rights and can enjoy the privilege of being uh, able to get educated. But I must say that there are thousands of capable and educated girls inside Afghanistan who are not allowed to get out of their homes without a male accompanying them, who are not allowed to go to schools, go to universities and to their offices. And this is very sad. So on the 17th of September, 2021, Taliban uh, released a statement banning girls from going to school. Uh, this statement was followed by 35 other decrees that eliminated girls from their basic human rights. Uh, and most important uh, of them was a decree that was rele uh, released on the 20th of uh, December, 2022, that banned girls from going to university. And I remember on that day when I was going through the news, I saw female students who were in their last day of exams before graduating were denied access to their class classrooms. And even some of those female students were inside their classrooms solving their, uh, their uh, um, exam papers and were asked to leave the classroom and leave the um, exam papers. While in the same exact uh, classroom, there were male students who were still continuing to uh, solve their exam papers. This is very frustrating. Um, because imagine if the girls in the UK were in that situation, or imagine if people here in this part of the world were denied access to all forms of education just because of their gender. How would the world react towards this? Uh, women uh, in Afghanistan, as I mentioned before, have not been silent. They, in their own ways, have uh, protested uh, either on the streets, um, demonstrating or uh, by writing uh, in the media or um, holding conferences in some um, close places where it has fortunately uh, reached the international media. So they have been brave enough to resist against the Taliban's barbaric de uh, decisions and policies. Um, and simply resist in a way that when the Taliban were telling them not to come to their offices, they would sh uh, still show up and be their best and try to uh, uh, change things around them. Uh, and let's not forget that it takes a lot of courage to do so when you know that the people you are protesting against are the ones that have killed people, as I mentioned before, or have committed suicide bombings for the past 20 years. So um, I will uh, end my uh, speech by saying that I strongly believe that by educating a woman, you not only educate one person, rather you educate a family and the whole society. This is why I, along with my family members, continue to uh, provide alternative ways and online classes uh, for the female students who are still inside uh, Afghanistan and cannot go to schools and universities. Uh, and let's not forget that there are women-centric movements taking shape in our part of the world, which is becoming the trend, uh, like the movements in Afghanistan and Iran. And those movements need solidarity, it needs uh, empowerment, and it needs uh, the world's recognition. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shahira. And uh, we'll pass it over now to Dr. Dinesh. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for including me. I apologize. I'm in the middle of teaching classes in university, so I will be brief and um, concise as much as possible. Um, I wanted to share a few words. I've been asked to say a few words about the situation of women in, in, in Iran. I think all of us who have been following the news, we know that we're um, now experiencing a historic moment in time in the sense that we are um, experiencing the first women-led women, women -led, uh, revolutionary upheaval in the history of a country that for the past at least 115 years, if not longer, has been seeking gender equality as the cornerstone of accessing life and freedom. Some of us may be more familiar with the Seneca Falls Convention and the manner in which it um, incepted and, and inaugurated a new era of understanding gender equality and the way in which it led to the suffragette movement, not only in the United States and the UK, but throughout the world. What we may not be aware of, and one of the arguments that perhaps we are facing in the Eastern world, uh, including in Iran, is that uh, women's place in society and seeking equality in the sense of the modern world is a Western construct that does not have place 
in several traditions, ethnically or religiously in the East, or that aspects of it need to be culturally adapted to work for certain places in the world. Well, um, what we tend to forget with that argument is that um, exactly at the same time, during the same year as the Seneca Falls Convention in the, in, in the United States, a single woman, um, my namesake actually, Tahare, stood in a conference that was occupied by all men and through a symbolic act announced the beginning of a new era for equality and justice symbolized by equal rights between women and men. Um, since then, we've been trying to access our rights, not only in Iran, but throughout the globe. Um, my colleague uh, a few minutes ago mentioned a very important right, which is the pivot around which increasing equality for both genders uh, rests, and that is the right to education. Again, um, a, an argument that needs to be debunked, not only by pointing out that you know, women's rights is not a Western construct, but actually at the same time that we were seeking this in the West, in the East, a woman raised the same similar call. Um, again, the right to education, exactly as it was quoted, that I actually put into an article that I published, I believe in the year 2000, that um, in many Islamic states, including Iran and, and Afghanistan, access to education and access to work are rights that are now being limited and mitigated based on gender-based policies. Whereas if we are dealing with states that are justifying these actions based on Islamic laws or interpretation of Islamic laws, we should be mindful of the fact that it is very much the very first word that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad was Eqra, read, right? So the ability to read lies at the heart of accessing all our rights. And it is more in, in, in the Islamic states, it is more of an inalienable right. It is a divine right that is given to everyone. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that in cases of Islamic states, such as Iran or Afghanistan, that we actually expand, encourage, not only protect, but promote the right to education for women. So this is something that really lies um, at the moment, at the forefront of where the women's movement in Iran is going to go. There are arguments, as you know, um, after the death of a young woman named Mahsa Amini on, on, uh, in September 2022. Um, uprisings have, have covered not only most of Iranian cities, if not all, but more than 150 cities around the planet. The Iranian community all over the world have been um, you know, standing with, with, with women in Iran and, and the people of Iran almost every weekend, seeking for the advancement of women's rights in that country. Um, however, where we're at at the moment is, is, is some argue, um, is, are we at a standstill? We're not. We are at a point where, as you know, over the past couple of weeks, the world has more and more come to know about um, uh, bio, bio attacks on uh, young women in Iran on young students, and that is gassing, literally gassing students and poisoning students using chemical gas to stop the demonstrations that are taking place and the, and the, and the, and the opposition that Iranian um, youth are expressing towards the uh, tyrannical laws that, that rule that country. Um, we're, we're now entering a new phase in the struggle for rights in Iran. And that new phase is marked by a couple of characteristics that are not only limited to Iran, but will expand to the international community. You have to remember that Iran uh, geopolitically plays a very important role in the region in the sense that it acts as a pregenitor of specific processes for change, particularly when it comes to the development of modern human rights law. So one example that is less known is that, for instance, the Convention on Genocide was something that was tested. One of the first cases where we tested elements of that convention was in 1950s Iran, when attacks on specific minorities were taking place, primarily the Baha'i minority. 
Um, there are also uh, ways in which Iran has set the same pattern. For instance, in 2009, we had a massive uprising in Iran that then led to the Arab Spring. And some of us argue that what we're experiencing in Iran today as the first female-led uh, revolution um, in, in modern Iran is something that will redefine women's rights in the region, if not globally. So the characteristics of the new phase that we are entering at the moment, one is that Iran is helping us to understand and solidify uh, grasping the notion that a revolution or dem peaceful demonstrations or objections to state policies are not events that happen, are there, finish and go and on to the next phase. They're actually processes of transformation and therefore they take longer than what we may expect it to. The second thing is that Iranians are introducing the first leaderless revolution in many ways. If you look at what is going on in Iran and say, who's leading this process? Well, there is no one answer to this question. And so what Iranians are doing is they're redefining the very concept of leadership in a country where you have a multicity of um, ethnic and religious communities and sexual communities. For the first time, we're moving towards forming coalitions in a meaningful way. So we have individuals who are at the leading edge of this movement. And even then, they're not really at the forefront. They're the ones who are emerging from the movement. For instance, one of the people who statistically is, is showing to be at the for, at, at, at leading this, this movement and, and emerging as a leading figure is a human rights lawyer who's currently in jail. Her name is Nasrin Sotudeh. So she hasn't been part of the demonstrations. She hasn't been issuing any, any guidance for the formation of this um, uh, uprising, but, but by living a life of value, by living a life of dedication to, to human rights and women's rights, she's inspiring a nation to stand up and seek the same ideals. Another dimension that, that, the, that will characterize the next phase of this particular movement is the manner in which we are empowering a process of change. This is no longer about people standing up and, and beating each other up or beating the authorities back. It is about how do we find new ways of expressing um, so, uh, access to our socioeconomic rights. Uh, we are transforming our, our, our uh, means of uh, means and modalities of accessing our rights from formal channels to informal channels. What I mean by that is that for a long time, we've all been standing up and saying, we don't have access to our rights and we demand it. We go through institutions, through institutional processes to demand and access our rights. This is now being transformed from institutional processes or formal processes to community-based or informal processes where, for, for instance, as a result of what's going on with, with the gas attacks on, on, on student bodies, more and more people are looking at home spaces where we could come together, teachers who can't go to work, students who can't go to work, coming together and forming classrooms and learning together. This is not that dissimilar to what we've been experiencing in Afghanistan. As my colleague said, I too have been involved in processes where we're bringing to people together in their living rooms, in their basements, coming together and studying together. Knowledge is knowledge. It's not dependent on what kind of whiteboard or blackboard is behind me. It's dependent on how I retain information, not in an authoritarian model that we used to in the past, but in a fully participatory manner in which consultation and collaboration become the means of learning. So these are some of the characteristics that are identifying this new phase of, of the upheaval that we're experiencing in Iran, the uprising that we're experiencing in Iran. And by it signaling the manner in which we are going to shift our understanding of how we access our socioeconomic rights globally. I'm, I'm eager to see what happens uh, with the Iranian uh, women's movement over the next few months. I'm, I'm very happy to see that in a country that for um, decades we've been encouraged to place men before women, that men are not only standing shoulder to shoulder with women, but they're learning how to also walk behind us, that there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes they lead, sometimes we lead. This is the way we balance, we yin and yang, 
the way we can operate our society in a meaningfully balanced way. I'm also eager to, to seek, um, to invite my um, younger sisters and, and colleagues who are in these spaces, whether they're in Iran, Afghanistan, or the diaspora communities associated with either of these wonderful nations and throughout the world, to learn to speak the language of equality. I find very often in my circles, we seek to alienate men in a way that then they turn around and, and oppress and suppress us even further. Whether it's conscious or unconscious, I'm not sure. We know from news articles that have been going out over the past few months, we've had prime ministers who have had to step down. We've had female heads of major multinationals that have had to step down. We've had important international figures who've had to step down from making it to the top. So the, you earlier you mentioned, I should say something about 30% Club. 30% Club is, is, is an organization that promotes um, that at least 30% of directors that lead multinationals and major organiza organizations should be women. But what we are learning is that it is not just to seek a seat at a table of power. It is that we need to redefine the dimensions of what constitutes power, what constitutes advance, advancement and prosperity so that women can meaningfully be part of it. Because if we're playing the same old games and just putting women instead of men, we're not gonna get anywhere, which is why we're seeing women make it all the way supposedly to the top, but then coming back down and saying, this is not working. We need to change the, the, the rules of the game. So. These are the things that I'm really hoping to see more and more. And I'm really inviting everyone here to go back to 1993 when the International Committee hosted the Vienna Conference, which was a significant milestone in the development of uh, modern human rights law, during which we one of the things that we, we highlighted, one of many, was the importance of men and boys owning the equality movement, men and boys taking the lead in establishing equality in all circles. And I truly feel at this moment that if we don't emphasize that through the way we create conditions of collaboration, that we're going to come to a standstill. So I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, and I look forward to anyone interested in this particular space to move this conversation beyond uh, just an event to a process of collaboration throughout the year. So hopefully when we come together next year in the same space, we have some tangible results of establishing equality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tahira and Shahira for those comments. Um, we're going to open the Q&A now. So if anyone has any questions, if they wanna put it in the Q&A box, um, I will communicate it to the panelists. Uh, Maybe I'll just make a few comments uh, as people are getting their questions ready. I think one of the things I really appreciate about both speakers is the fact that you both emphasize the fact that we need to deconstruct and move away from the idea that women's rights or gender equality um, is some, or feminism really is something that is a Western owned concept, right? Or that the West has a particular idea that everyone else should then adhere to. But really, we need to understand and remember that feminism is about the struggle for equality. It's about you know, the struggle against imperialism. And if we think about it as a struggle for justice, then you know, it's important to recognize that women all over the world throughout history have had that struggle and been at the forefront, really. It's not something that begins or is defined by kind of like Western ideas. And that the way that women struggle is different, right? And we have to recognize those different strategies um, in the fight for equality. So thank you both for that. Um, and then do we have any questions in the chat? Can't see the chat box. Maybe I can start off um, by throwing out a few questions myself. Um, Shahura, there's a hand up. Okay, we have one question. Do you wanna go ahead, Shireen? <laughs> Shireen, you have a question? <laughs> It's actually for me. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to ask, first of all, thank you so much for your very inspirational contributions. Um, what I was going to ask is, um, for the men as well as the women here today, what would you want us to take away from what you've said about how we can, as people who are um, outside Afghanistan and outside Iran, but also remembering that there are women in Yemen, there are women in Palestine, there are women in Liberia, there are women in Somalia, there are women in the UK, 
all of us have experienced a pushback against our achievements since the pandemic was declared. Um, so what would be your ideal takeaways um, for us from this event today? Because I, I was very careful in publicizing this, not to say celebrate Women's Day, because I really don't feel like, you know, um, I think we're marking it, but we have yet to celebrate. So yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Shireen. I think uh, there's one question in the chat that's related to Shireen's question. So I think I'll pose that to you as well and you can take both of them at the same time. So we have a question for from Amy North and she would like to know what practical things people in the UK or other parts of the world can do to support and or stand in solidarity with women and girls in Afghanistan and Iran. Um, so what kind of things can people who would like to act in solidarity um, do to support again, the women's movements or women's struggle in, in Afghanistan and Iran. And then one more question from Anita Anahita. Um, and she is asking, she said, I would be interested to hear more about emerging alternative methods of providing and accessing education in Afghanistan. Are informal home-based classrooms somewhat allowed or maybe tolerated by the Taliban? Um, and if not, what would be the consequences of women facilitating these alternative methods? And I might just add to that, Shahira, um, there's been a lot of discussion, because I work on Afghanistan, so there's been a lot of discussion on perhaps using the online space or online education or distance learning as an alternative to kind of reach women and girls in Afghanistan. And uh, it would be interesting if you could tell us if you think that that's you know, a potential way to facilitate education, or is it something that's going to be um, kind of like monitored and, uh, by the Taliban and, and maybe not useful to many women who are in rural areas, for um, example? Okay. So thank you for your question. Uh, so about the first question by Amy, thank you for your question. So uh, I think one of one of the most practical um, things that you can do and stand in solidarity with the women in Afghanistan and Iran can be to um, help in your capacity to for the, uh, to them for like being able to um, um, perform online classes. For example, I will give you an example uh, that there are students from Cam Cambridge Universities, from King's College, from UCL itself, that are um, helping students in Afghanistan, mostly in rural areas, with online classes, teaching them English. So, um, for example, if they want to apply for a scholarship in the future, they already have a knowledge of uh, the language that is required so they can apply for a scholarship and study abroad so that's uh, one thing you can do and i will um, if you want i can provide you with um, with the information of those girls uh, you can contact me directly we have so many like we have 800 um, girls inside afghanistan um, in rural areas and urban areas that are um, uh, seeking online knowledge um, uh, and classes so you you can help them through that um and um uh, is that is that it does that qu answer the question yeah thank you that's great um dr um danish would you like to make some comments sure uh, in terms of what we can do to to um advance the cause i think that what what Shireen said is is actually absolutely important we're all experiencing a universal um sense of regress although i think it's progress but in a in a new way in a new direction um and it's important for us to to take that understanding and realization and recognize that the us and them mentality that has brought our world to a standstill no longer works that what happens to my sister behind closed doors or to my brother behind closed doors in Libya, in Afghanistan, in, in Sierra Leone is happening to me at this very moment. So there are certain principles that need to be distilled from uh, the many facts and figures that are thrown, again, uh, thrown at us from different cases. And these principles are universal. So seeking justice is universal. Seeking equality is, is, is universal. And, and understanding how these dynamics work in the modern world 
belongs to all of us. It is not something that we could say, you should do this to have justice, you should do that to have equality, but it is a participatory process of investigation through action, reflection, learning to see what it is that we can do together. So the answer, the, the, the long answer to your, to your uh, question is what I get, but the short answer is please immediately begin an act of service because it's only through doing that we learn what to do next. Um, um, there, was, there was another question that I think, um, I, I don't have it, but did, there was another point about using online. Is that uh, alternatives? Yeah, alternative uh, methods of providing access to education. Oh, we, we've, been, we've been using the online space in, in many different settings, including Iran and Afghanistan for a long time, but Afghanistan as probably uh, uh, my dear colleague will, will tell you has, a very diverse range of access to, to internet. So what you could get in, in, in one place may not be what is possible in another place. So it's good to have those alternatives, but, but ultimately what we're experiencing is that just like countries are hitting back against equality, they're also hitting back against the internet. And you know, led by countries like China, they're saying we're going to have our own intranet then what are we going to do, right? So it's very important. I think the most important resource that we need, have and we need to train is our human resources. So immediately engage in, in training facilitators, animators who are able to run study circles, to look at specific topics, to look at specific practical skills that we need to develop. And once you have those, those human resources at the local level, to, to be creative, to be resilient to any condition that's thrown at you, then the ways of moving forward will come to you regardless of what the challenges may be. The important thing is for us to be able to analyze and synthesize facts, to read our reality, our immediate spaces, identify how we can lead to empowerment, identify the paths to incorporating diverse points of view, and working together, consultation, collaboration. These are the two things we need universally in order to, to move ahead in any kind of threat or um, disaster to translate them and transform them into opportunities and advancement. I hope that's helpful. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Danish. Okay, so we have two more questions. Uh, there's an anonymous question from the audience. Um, are the attitudes of younger men any different to the older men um, towards men? I think it's towards women, it should be. And um, how can we as women influence our sons? So I guess that speaks to the kind of intergenerational dynamics. So do you find younger men are um, acting more in solidarity with women and with the women's struggle in Afghanistan and Iran? Um, or do you also find that there are conservative attitudes there that's pushed back against what the women's movements are trying to achieve in these countries? And then one more question from Elaine. She asks, can you comment on the announcement today by some Afghan feminists about using international legislation to identify the policies of the Taliban as gender apartheid? And what some of the steps flowing from this might be for women in Afghanistan and possibly Iran? Um, so maybe if you want to take the first question about the intergenerational differences between men and then Elaine's question about the, the announcement today. Uh, me? Go ahead, Shira. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, um, as you mentioned, there are um, some, um, there are resistance by women, but we have seen less re resistance by men in Afghanistan. Um, there are military resistance by men, but not this, the um, the same resistance that are happening by the women through social media, or through, through protesting. Um, Afghanistan in itself um, is a very patriarchal society. Some rural areas, um, like there are some rural areas that uh, before even Taliban coming to power were not allowing their daughters to go to school. So this is just the mindset of some people um, that have prevented their daughters from going to school or from getting educated. But this was never in our laws on, or in our um, rights. This was, uh, we were never banned from going to school by our institutions and our governments. It was only some men who uh, had like conservative ideas towards uh, women's rights. Um, 
on and on a question of how can we uh, as women influence our sons just um, be their uh, ro role model um, uh, lead by example not only by talks and show uh, what change can be so as I mentioned before, if you educate um, a woman, you educate a whole family and a society. So a woman who is edu educated in the family can educate their daughters and son, uh, sons and then a, a change can, uh, can come. So yeah. Um, if I may add to the wonderful remarks of, uh, of my dear colleague. Um, First of all, um, I don't think there is any way of um, doing engaging in faulty generalization. I don't want to say younger men are better or worse than the older generation, but what I do want to share is that the younger generation of men are certainly exposed to this pushback that we are all experiencing. And so they're seeing their fathers, they're seeing their bosses do just that. And Actions sometimes speak far louder than words. So there may be a lot of words about equality and commitment and legislation and this and that. But what our younger men are seeing is a rise in the othering, denigration, and often dehumanization of women. When Shohra could probably speak about this more. A few weeks ago, when a spokesperson of the Taliban government came out and said, women are like land that men must sow their seeds in, that was ultimate dehumanization. In other words, you can walk all over a woman. That's, this, that's the image that was communicated. And of course, their policies embody just that. And, and that's not only something that we see in Afghanistan. Remember, not too long ago in this country, our elected officials have engaged in, in acts of infidelity or the part of the world where I come from, as you can probably guess from my accent, we had the highest elected official of a land saying women can be grabbed in a certain way and that they will enjoy it. Well, if these are the lessons that we are providing to the younger men, what do we expect from them? So the way to, to deal with this, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to Elaine, um, given the wonderful expert and well-known academic that she is for the, for the point that she has raised. It is important that, that these feminists are coming and, and calling on international legislation to identify these policies. But I'm saying this with all due respect, as a human rights law professor, law has its place but it doesn't necessarily have much to do with delivery of justice or equality. What we need to change, exactly the example that Shoha gave, some of what we are seeing has nothing to do with legislation or policy, it has to do with the way in which our, we've been cultured, we've been inculcated to manifest these inequalities as the way to be. So to me, Legislation is important, absolutely. Giving policy is important, policy recommendations, but it is useless unless it is coupled with education and transformation of individuals, institutions, and communities. These are the three protagonists that we have in every society. So if we're willing to move forward in this balanced way by coupling these processes, then yes, we will get somewhere. And, and to this effect, I published a paper um, uh, about two years ago after a talk that I gave at the British Institute for Comparative uh, uh, and International Law, which I'm happy to share the link uh, later on. I actually engaged in a two year long project in, in Iran and among Iranian diaspora where we taught values um, taken from, from old Persian, Iranian, um, value systems that are that are very important to us and writings that we have from Shahnameh, from Bustan, Golestan, Sadi, and so on and so forth, that are now being distilled and actually, you know, made into one as universal values that we even have at the Jubilee Center at Birmingham University. So we, we engaged in value education of the young generation. And it was amazing the way we measured their attitudes towards cultural rights of minorities before and after they were taught these values. It was night and day. So I think that was a sample of what we can do at the grassroots level with education, 
and couple it at the level of decision makers and high level with policies that then interplay with the implementations of these values. So I think that's one way to move forward. Um, can I also add a, a small um, point? So um, just to un, uh, add a small point to what uh, Professor um, uh, Tahira um, said and uh, to answer El uh, Doc, um, Professor Elaine's question, um, I think it's time the world um, um, recognizes some of these women movements internationally, like the uh, movement uh, of uh, AWCC, Afghan Women Coalition for Change, because for the past 20 years, when the Taliban were the opposition, they were given the offices, they were um, supported by some governments, and now Afghan women and um, Iranian women need the same um, kind of support and recognition by the world to um, to uh, to um, uh, identify the policies of the Taliban as uh, gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. So any other questions in the audience, please put them in the Q&A. If not, I think I might abuse my powers of chair <laughs> and ask one last question. So I think the discussion has really um, come to, oh, there's, no, there's not one, uh, a really interesting point in terms of talking about things like uh, values and the role of law versus, you know, actually concrete grassroots change in terms of how we think and relate to each other. Um, and because this is the LDC and, you know, a lot of people here work in development or, you know, are in the development field or learning about it. Uh, I think it's important to perhaps ask, uh, you know, the international community, uh, if we can say that, they've, you know, there's a lot of talk about gender equality, right? And when we talk about things like um, values, it becomes tricky because, you know, the, the international development architecture itself is one that is rooted in Eurocentrism and like Western values. So a lot of the work in gender equality has been uh, imposed, right? So it's gender equality in a particular way. And that actually hasn't led to the types of change that is transformative, even though, you know, in the aid world, they like to use that word. So what would you say is a useful role then for international, uh, those interested in international development or the international development kind of architecture agencies and donors in terms of supporting the types of change that you've talked about today that actually can make a difference, um, but at the same time, not re, um, you know, uh, reproducing the same types of Western centric um, impositions of programs and policies that have actually held back women's movements in many countries in the world like Afghanistan and Iran. Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I'm not so sure that what we are um, sharing in the international communities is Eurocentric. I think they are far more rooted. We have far more in common than not. Let me put it that way. And certainly I can, I can speak with a certain level of academic uh, <laughs> certainty that the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights actually included quite a few sets of representatives from different parts of the world at the time. And with the International Bill of Rights, we expanded that with all the other declarations and conventions as the membership of the United Nations, because you know we have to realize the number of countries, member states of the United Nations shift as we shift our borders. And who's come up with borders? We have, right? The fact of the matter is that when we look into the deepest, deepest roots of values in different parts of the world, I'm not aware of any culture that would, for instance, say truthfulness is not a good idea. I have yet to find a culture that opposes that. I have yet to find a culture or a religion or, or a group of population that says justice is not a good idea. I have yet to find a, a set of uh, any population that says compassion is not a good idea. We may condition it, for instance, the con concept of community or belonging in, in the Islamic sense, maybe the concept of Oma may be limited to religious adherence, but the concept is still there. And as we have evolved from different stages of humanity, from little you know, uh, localities and villages to now the international community, these concepts have also evolved with us. So sometimes our concepts that 
in their infancy, in their nucleus are actually universal. Truthfulness and respect for truthfulness is universal. Respect for love is universal. Respect for justice is universal. But our modalities of accessing them shift according to our socioeconomic and cultural dynamics, right? Just as the example that I gave, the concept of community in Islam, it's ummah, so it's based on religious adherence. In the secular West, it may just be you exist, inalienability, and so on and so forth. But what I'm trying to get at is that if we come together with a sense of servant leadership built on the fact that the world has reached to, you know, we're talking about this concepts during CSWC uh, at this moment where we are looking at women and values in technology and women's inclusion in technology and AI. We have reached a point with our communication technologies where authenticity is palpable. And it's important for us to understand that, yes, for a long time, what we were offering the developing world wasn't authentic. It was to create more debt and to enslave them further. So if we are going to be authentic, then we have to live the values we're going to share, which is why earlier I said we have to become facilitators of education, not teachers and professors, facilitators, animators, collaborators of, of of creating consult consultation and collaboration. These are the ways through which we could be more effective and bring about real change. Thank you, Dr. Ash. Um, and Shahra, do you have any last words? I think we've lost her for a second. Shahra, are you still there? Oh, something might happen to the connection. Okay, thank you. That was an excellent note uh, on which to end, Dr. Danish. And I think uh, we're just almost out of time. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, you know, today, International Women's Day, we kind of acknowledge the contributions of women everywhere, as Shireen um, pointed out, but there are still, you know, contestations over what this means, right? The session today reminded us not just of the obstacles and harsh living conditions of uh, many women around the world and that are forced to live under, uh, particularly focusing on Afghanistan and Iran, but also it should remind us of the struggles, the bravery and the agency of women in these countries. And the fact that it's often women's voices and lives that are at the forefront of these movements in partnership with men sometimes, but they really push for the social, political and economic change that many of us would like to see. And as we learn more about their collective action um, and you know, the, that of those that came before them, it's important that we see them not as victims really, but as agents and as leaders. Right, who are at the core of some of these movements, pushing for change in the way that um, we live, the way that we relate to each other, the way we govern ourselves, and actually the very ways in which we define what rights are for women and for humanity. So thank you again to uh, Shahara and to Dr. Danish and Shireen, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, thank you all for your contribution to today and to everyone who's attended and particularly those who've asked questions. Do please stay in touch with us. Do please remain conscious to everything that's happening. Um, I was just thinking about the, um, the Me Too movement and you know, how recently it was that I found out that that was actually started by black women in North America. And, you know, we talk about women, of course, in, uh, I'm going to use the phrase, a global South, but of course there are women in indigenous communities in Australia, in North and South America, in Canada, who are still live, living with a very direct impact of settler colonialism. Um, and I also think we need to be calling out just on an everyday basis, the kind of language that we hear in popular culture. It's just awful, please, what, what young women are growing up being referred to as. So yes, there, is, there are contributions that we can all make and that we should make because it's in all of our interests. So I'm very grateful to have had this opportunity to learn more today, to get some inspiration, um, and also to meet those of you that we haven't met before. Um, we have another event coming up in May, which is looking at food systems. We do need to transform who gets access to food in this world that we live in. 
Um, there is so much more that we can do. If you want us to feature your work, um, network with you, promote your work, get in touch with us through Twitter, admin at lidc.ac.uk. And thank you very, very much for joining us today. We have recorded this and we will be sharing the recording. So on that note, um, yes, I just end by repeating our very grateful thanks. Thank you. Take good care and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.